uh, what, one of the uh, one of the treats in the in the in, in our community was when people brought archaeologists to show us slides, because of course you have to turn off the lights to look at the slides, um, and it's always very interesting to see archaeologists at work because it's nothing like I was doing. So you could simply appreciate what they were doing and see how it worked. And the lights were off, so you couldn't take notes even if you wanted to. So it was marvelous. Uh, whereas back in, in the real graduate seminar, people would be suggesting books that were irritatingly relevant uh, to what you were doing from authors who seemed to have spent a lifetime working in areas that did seem just a little bit like you should know about them. Very annoying, very annoying. So I, I hope 19th century modernism doesn't really come near anybody. Uh, and if it does, I apologize. Uh, and and we'll, we'll go off and have a, <laughs> an incredibly introverted and boring cup of coffee afterwards together. Now, um, a bit about the 19th century and, and, and what, what it meant theologically. Um, City pointing the clicker and it smiled at him. Uh -huh. Come along, little clicker. Do, 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 do. Oh, look at that. Um, broadly speaking, what I was being schooled in at the time was what we would probably call historical theology. And in, in the land of historical theology, the 19th century is, is kind of a, uh, something that we tussle over quite a bit. Claude Welch wrote a really important essay at one stage called The Problem of 19th Century Theology. Um, which he has gone on to rewrite, calling it the problem of 19th century theology revisited. And part of what he was saying, and he was writing it towards the, the middle end of the, of the 20th century, was that he felt that the 19th century was very, very close to us. And therefore, it was hard to get a sense of the distance. That we were talking about people who theologically could possibly be our grandparents, as, as, as opposed to further back. And therefore, it was hard to get a, a sense of difference. The continuity was all too apparent to Welsh. I think that's probably uh, something that we look now as, as rather quaint, because the 19th century seems to have moved further, further back, plus theological fashions come and go. Uh, by the time I came to write my, my thesis and be examined, by Professor Lash, by name and by nature. Um, it, it, it was, you know, radical orthodoxy, so-called, had begun to, to come in through the, the vents into the room. Uh, and the 19th century was looking very long ago and very far away. And even if you demonstrate that Professor X influenced Professor Y and Z, which was the burden of what I was demonstrating, there was still that awkwardness as to why are you wasting your time looking at Professors X, Y and Z since they belong to the, the awful 19th century, which we're no longer interested in. So the 19th century was a curious, a curious place. But not everybody sort of saw it that way. Um, one of the most interesting people to read on it, of course, is Karl Barth's history of Protestant theology in the 19th century. And the, the first rendition of it into English was, was given us from Rousseau to Ritual, uh, which Barth himself disliked because it took too many shortcuts in the translation. Barth, being a good German theologian does not like the notion of shortcuts. That is, that, is, that is an abomination and ruled out in Leviticus. So for him, Rousseau to ritual needed to be strengthened out. We needed to get this longer perspective on how we got to where we were. And he wanted people to engage with the 19th century because as he would have seen it, it cast a very long shadow over what we were doing theologically, ethically, politically. And one of the most interesting things in all of that, of course, is the, what I put up there is the problem of Schleiermacher in Protestant theology. We, we have a tendency, I suppose, to see the 19th century as running theologically in Protestantism from Schleiermacher to Barth. And if you're on the Schleiermacher side of the fence, you, you, you think that's not a development I like the look of. On the other hand, if you're wearing your Barthian outfit, you tend to look at it and think, that's fine, we like that. But it, it doesn't work quite as easily as that, because Bart with Schleiermacher is like a dog with a much-loved bone. Um, you, you, you know, when, when your dog has buried the, the appalling thing, half an hour later he's gone after it again, you know, and, and the thing has probably appeared in your sitting room, and you're thinking, oh, no, not again. So Bart keeps digging up Schleiermacher, and, you know, he finds his faults, he finds his good things, and he will not allow anybody else to criticize Schleiermacher. I mean, poor old Emil Brunner tried to criticize Schleiermacher and, and found Professor Barth jumping on him from a very great height. So th there's a kind of an ambivalence that although he thinks there's something not quite 
not quite kosher about Schleiermacher and his turn to experience, since that obviously means fallen experience, he still admires Schleiermacher greatly. Now, meanwhile, on the other side of the fence, in Roman Catholicism, which is really the burden of what I'm looking at, um, you, you had the triumph of a very reactionary style of ultramontanism at Vatican I. But the preparation for that had been put in place throughout the 19th century. Uh, ultramontane Roman Catholicism is that identification of Catholicism with Rome. It's very much a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, it's associated in, in, in large part uh, with a couple of things. Mostly, most obviously, the collapse of the Papal States. As Italy took shape, the Papal States withdrew, and gradually you have a very small holding of territory. We, we look at this now, and, and it has that wonderful inevitability about it, and therefore we don't pick up on it. But for 19th century Catholics, the loss of the Papal States was, 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 was a shock to core values. There was a slight worry at one stage amongst English Catholic leaders that the folk in Rome were going to make the temporal power of the Bishop of Rome a dogma. It was viewed that, 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 that you know, it, was, it was both that, that much of a lost cause and also um, that, that seriously. So they had a very centralized vision of what Catholicism was. Um, culminating in 1870, in the run-up to 1870, you have a great deal of local and regional diversity. Uh, the triumph of ultramontanism was also a triumph of extreme centralization and a tendency to see itself as being at the victim's end of history, to see all sorts of horrible encroachments coming on it. Rome had never really got over 1789. France was supposed to be the eldest daughter of the church. Um, and it had gone off on this mad democratic thing that it had never fully recovered from. And certainly Rome hadn't quite, quite recovered from that. And in many ways, when we sort of look at that, that interesting conspectus of what's going on in the 19th century, for both traditions, Protestant and Catholic in the West, the kind of theological history, that the issue that they were all wrestling with, Protestants called it faith and history. Catholics tended to call it history and dogma. But it was the emergence of historical consciousness as a major theological issue and bringing with it the question of change. And that, I'm afraid, doesn't go away. That remains with everybody as to how do churches negotiate change. Um, it's been said that the 19th century saw the, the invention of history as a discipline, as a popular discipline. Certainly most of the chairs in the universities begin to emerge in the 19th century as we we get a sense not only that the past is very far away and very much further away than we thought, but also the sense that we need to have special disciplines in order to enable us to, to get back there. And that's a, a somewhat alienating thing. And it's alienating in two regards. Existentially, it pushes things back from us. Things that were more immediate suddenly move a little bit further back. But for religions like Christianity, which have a strong historical component, th that has a doctrinal issue too. Because in Christianity, we want to advance truth claims, and those truth claims are intimately connected with historical events. So the connection between the historian and the believer is a strong one, or should be a strong one. It might be an awkward one, but it's a strong one nonetheless. Historians tend not to deal in absolute certainties. They, they like probabilities. They like revising their findings. Um, probabilities isn't really the kind of language in which faith tends comfortably to articulate itself. You know, we, we tend not to start off the Nicene Creed with we probably believe in God. <laughs> it might be, for some, it might be more honest, but we don't go with a list of probabilities. It, we, 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 so this is a bit of a difficulty here. And as the historians begin to dig in to what's going on, we begin to see all sorts of interesting crises emerging in the church. So obviously the quest for the historical Jesus is probably the, the great example and that the, 
the more German professors dug into him, the more they discovered that Jesus was, in fact, a, a German professor. You know, this is the great, the great discovery of Schweitzer that they, they were actually looking in a mirror. Um, um, the other thing, I suppose, that comes out of it is that, that, that how do you jump from history to dogma becomes the question. How do you make, if there is a kind of, oh, if you have the sense that the train has left the station and you're running after it, how do you connect with it? And one of the most amusing books on this, uh, I'm sure you've read it, is Terence Ranger and, and Eric Hobsbawm's wonderful book, The Invention of Tradition in the 19th Century. It, it, it's, it's marvelous, just even for, for bedtime reading for academics. It's one of the most funny books ever, because it's looking at how the 19th century specialized in invent, inventing traditions. Um, now, I, I, for four years, I lived in the seminary, and I know how this works. You know, if something happens twice, it's a sacred tradition. But there's also the sense here that, that, that people are alienated from their roots. There's mass industrialization. Therefore, doing things that are traditional in traditional ways assume a much, much greater, much greater importance. So we try to jump between these things. Now, I suppose the other thing is, well, one of the nicest synopses of the 19th century that I've come across is, is Joseph Fitzer, who's an American historian of, of Catholic development who just comes up with four words to get the, the, the impact of the 19th century. Trains, Darwin, vaccination, Freud. Uh, and it's, you, know, you have to imagine you're, 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 you're the 19th century church standing in the corner and, and the person has come out of the other corner and just whacked you with these four and you think, go <laughs> towel in. Um, now, they're very good because they're well chosen. Trains meant mass movement, meant mass migration, but also meant the transfer of ideas. In the early 19th century, successive popes refused to allow trains into the papal states because they had cunningly observed that democracy seems to go wherever the trains go. So if you, know, you could stop democracy coming simply by not building railways. Excellent. Um, <coughs> Darwin, of course, is, is, is one of these marvelously uh, central figures because the, I mean, evolution wasn't new in the 19th century. What he supplied was the, the idea of, uh, of natural selection. Um, and that seems to have pressed a, a very raw nerve in, 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 our, in our grandparents. You know, that the zoological gardens was a wonderful Victorian invention, but the idea that you might actually be going to meet the relatives, um, as, as opposed simply to, 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 to look at the funny animals, that, that came as a bit of a shock to the system. Um, vaccination, of course, brings all sorts of connotations. It increases populations, obviously, but it also gives rise to things that are going to be very much in vogue as the 19th turns into the 20th century about eugenics, which seems to be the idea that floats around some, some quite surprising intellectuals who you'd like to think knew better but, but manifestly didn't. And finally, Mr. Freud, um, who takes the lovely rational 18th century man. I mean, that's the great beginning of Karl Barth's history is man in the 18th century, you know, where the human being is presented as supremely rational, thoughtful, moral, all of these things. And Freud says, mm -mm 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 -mm, sex crazed lunatic, you know, that's you. You know, you may be wearing a suit, but you know, <laughs> Dionysus always strikes back. Um, so there we are, trains, Darwin, vaccination, Freud, and the, and the church trying desperately to, to cope with this. So we move on to what happens at the end, how to have a religious crisis. Um, well, there are a couple of things that are there on the part of, that are part of the ingredients list that are beginning to, 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 to bubble up for Rome at the end of the 19th century. First of all, you have, Charles Taylor has coined this phrase, a social imaginary, sort of this, it's the new word for worldview, folks. Um, so we have a, a reactionary social imaginary. It's, it's hard to imagine anybody more reactionary than Pius IX. John Henry Newman said, it is not a good thing for popes to live too long. Um, he, 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 and he had Pius firmly in mind uh, for that. Uh, Pius had begun as a, as, as a bit of an optimistic liberal and, and then had met the Republican face of the young Italian movement and decided he actually preferred being a reactionary. It seemed safer. But you also had a, a theological climate in Catholicism which had always emphasized 
changelessness because the people that changed were obviously the Protestants. You know, as soon as the Protestants split off, they split again and just kept splitting. You know, they just had this obsession with changing every five minutes. Uh, whereas Rome was always the same, sempore adam. So as the historians were beginning to pick up evidence that things had not always followed this kind of line uh, in terms of historical consciousness, Rome was still answering with sempore adam. This was, this was the clear rhetoric. The church was now as it had always been. Um, it was a very lacking thing. So a good example of this is a document uh, issued in 1864 called the Syllabus of Errors. This is, this, this is what it's like. You know, to, to be a pope in 1864 is good because you, know, you can just lift, give a syllabus as a list. You, know, you can just issue to the press, here is a list of wrong things. <laughs> Do it this afternoon if you felt like it. And this is the most famous of the propositions that he condemned. The Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself and come to terms with progress liberalism and modern civilization, as if. Um, in one of his wonderful books about this period, uh, Owen Shadwick has said, you know, this, liberalism is a very context-dependent word. You have to find out, when somebody says, I don't like liberalism, you have to find out what they mean by it, because otherwise it sort of seems to cover everything from Thatcherite economics to historical critical methods, which is a bit too much. But he said, you know, there was a kind of a culture. It was vaguely assumed. A lot of Catholics were siding with it around the world, but now the Pope had gone against it. So we begin to see the emergence, not just of a, a centralized authority pointing one way, but would we call it a groundswell? Possibly not. But we would see that there was a, a climate of dissent emerging, that people were feeling that Rome hadn't quite got it yet. Uh, that, that, that there wasn't a good reaction to this. But the problem with the syllabus is that it's simply a list. It doesn't have a kind of coherence about it. I mean, if, if this comes in in your inbox and you say, oh, well, the Pope doesn't like democracy, well, that's fine, I'm going for a picnic. There's no force behind it. There's no coherence behind it. And what you need, um, if you want to make the crisis really get going, um, is, is, is you need know, this... This handsome devil is, is, is Pius IX, uh, who, towards the end of his papacy, uh, held the First Vatican Council of 1870, uh, which came to an end when Italy invaded um, and the French withdrew. Symbolically, this is just awful. I mean, the, the eldest daughter of the church has gone home to fight the Prussians um, and lose. And um, he's left becoming the prisoner of the Vatican. But in some ways, some, some historians would see that as it loses, 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 loses temporal power, its only response was to say, well, we will have a personal infallibility of the papal magisterium. Um, it's kind of a, presented almost as a last rush of, of ego. What's very interesting about it is that of all the debates around papal authority and particularly infallibility, it went with a minimalist definition of what infallibility would mean. But it's kind of curious, it's not just the church, it's also something about our era, that there has always been a tendency to maximize the way in which that infallibility is to be interpreted. So anything the Pope says is very often reported, whether by the Catholic press or by the secular media as though it is an infallible pronouncement. So there is a kind of a, this sets in place a kind of a creeping infallibilism, very much focused on, on, on Rome and very much associated with this centralized vision of Catholicism. It makes it easier to identify with Catholicism is as the Pope says it is. So that's the centralized authority structure um, you also need a coherent orthodoxy. When Pius IX stood down as Pope due to death, um, he was immensely, immensely unpopular. His, his funeral, they had, they had to have a couple of goes at his funeral because um, the, the population of Rome kept trying to st steal his coffin and throw it in the river. He wasn't, he hadn't gone down terribly well. There are newspaper 
editorials at the time of his death which speculate that really he's, the papacy is on its last legs. He, he, he had been a very unpopular European leader. He'd been an unpopular teacher. Um, for many people outside the bounds of Catholicism, infallibility looked like the last gasp of a crazy man. Um, you know, so all of this was taken up in, in sort of the, the, the Times of London would certainly have taken this particular line. Um, he was replaced by an elderly diplomat, uh, Leo XIII. Leo XIII was seen by some as maybe a safe pair of hands to, to wrap the whole thing up. But you see, you should never underestimate the powers of elderly diplomats. He, 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 he was marvelous, quite a charm offensive man. But he also was nervous that he saw Catholic Christianity, despite its potential for being universal and widespread, as being a bit chaotic. And he wanted to give it a unitary theological method, a unitary view of how theology is done and what is done. And he imposed the thinking of Thomas Aquinas. In 1879, uh, he, he decided that, that the answer to the 19th century was the 13th century. Now, medievalists are obviously very happy about that. And, and it's of a piece with a lot of 19th century things because in this part of the world we thought that Sir Walter Scott was the answer to everything. So, you know, it, 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 it fits, but it also doesn't fit because the, the baddie, as far as the Roman schools were all concerned, was Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant was a baddie because he was associated with subjectivism but also because he was associated with Protestantism. So subjectivism and Protestantism, probably the same thing in the eyes of the Roman schools. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't like that. The, the, the Roman journals speak about il valeno cantiano, the Kantian poison. And it's presented in all their literature, not just as though it's the wrong philosophy, but as though it's some kind of morally debilitating illness. That if you, if you start reading Immanuel Kant, people will be able to see it from the way you walk. You know, <laughs> Kantian, beware. Um, and this idea of this very coherent ideology of what Catholic Christianity was allowed for what the sociologist Lester Kurtz calls the definition of deviant, that says outsiders, it's meant to be insiders. I beg your pardon, deviant outsiders are not a problem. It's deviant insiders that we're much more interested in because anyone, you've now got this interesting way, Catholicism has been defined as Thomism or neo-scholasticism. But if you happen to be a Catholic who doesn't happen to subscribe to St. Thomas as the answer to everything, you're not being a Catholic, are you? So this becomes a big problem, that if you decided that there is a, a unitary method that characterizes what it is to be Catholic. And you know, we all see this happening in our, in our various fields of theology when some particular new method suddenly hogs the field and everybody keeps going on about it. Um, and if you don't go with it, you sometimes feel as though I must, you know, on a good day you think I'm just not getting it. You know, on, on a bad day you think I'm, I'm past it. You know, this is, this, this is the same kind of dynamic here, except it carries the potential that if you don't get it, you might be heretical. That, that if you're looking at other ways of doing theology and thinking that you're Catholic. Now, what, what were the alternatives that were uh, floating around? Um, well, the Protestants of the time, and particularly Protestant historiography, had taken to um, evolutionary and idealistic philosophies in the aftermath of people like Mr. Hegel. Um, most of the liberal Protestant historians of the 19th century read history as in terms of discontinuity. There was the Church of the Apostles, there was a large period of Catholic darkness, and then there was Luther. Um, if you are more on the liberal side, you might be nervous as to whether you would give all the credit to Luther, you might want Kant, or Luther and Kant together. Um, but there was a sense that history had been able to start again. And part of the starting again meant that you were able to strip off all the cultural accretions and Harnack famously talked about Hellenization, that he felt that Christianity, as it moved out into the, into, into the world of the Mediterranean, had lost something essential. It, it had lost its, its primal Galilean simplicity and had become all horribly metaphorical and metaphysical and Greek. 
uh, and, and that somehow or other we could now strip all that back off and get back to not the religion uh, about Jesus, but as he said, the religion of Jesus. So he thought Christianity was essentially simple. It got cluttered up with Hellenization. The Trinity, for example, would be, I think, what he called the acute example of the Hellenization of, of, of Christianity. But the papacy was all part of that. So really what you need to do as a Protestant is from time to time you dip Christianity into an acid bath and it comes up all nice and shiny and justification. Um, that's the Protestant take on history. On the Catholic side, John Henry Newman was, was the man who seemed to suffer most from this new centralized vision coming out of headquarters. Um, Newman had enjoyed quite a... I'm not, he's, 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 be, he's been in the news lately because of his, 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 his elevations. Um, he started life as, as a... I think his family was sort of non-religiously committed. He called them Bible Protestants. He then underwent uh, an evangelical conversion in his late teens went to Oxford, became a very high and dry church person, and then in 1845 he, he moved to, to Roman Catholicism. And in doing this, he, he, he claimed that he was really following where the evidence led. He's very historically conscious. He, he loves reading the church fathers. That doesn't mean he's a patristic specialist. It means he has a big collection of the works of the fathers. Every so often one has to insist on the difference between that, you know. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of books, but <laughs> I is not a specialist. And the basic theory that he advanced in 1845 was that Christianity has changed in order to stay the same. And this was what he called the development of Christian doctrine. So his test case was that if, if the apostles were to go walking around the streets of London, would they know which church to go to? Would they recognize continuity somewhere between the church that they knew and the church as it is now? And Newman said, yes, they would. They would be able to recognize that in Catholicism, they would find the main church. Now, what's important about, about this is that it's, it, it can be a little bit, he's, he's a little bit too good to be true in talking about, about change and development. But he's answering a particular need of the time. He is hearing the discontinuity people. Um, he does have this rather peculiar tendency to say that those who advocate discontinuity in history, they're advocating something that's quite unnatural that doesn't suggest itself naturally to us. That's not the way we think of history developing. So they need to develop that view scientifically. And until they do so, I'm carrying on in this direction. So he puts all his eggs in the continuity basket, but calls it development, which is a, a nod to the possibility of change. And very importantly here comes the notion of revelation. At, at his heart, Newman remains an old-fashioned empiricist. He, he talks about how Christianity is an idea. Now, it's not, a, it's not an idea as we would think of it. It's idea in it, its Coleridgean sense. Ideas are these extraordinarily, intrinsically complex realities that are impressed onto the mind. They're not simple which is what Harnack would have said the idea of Christianity was, they're actually intrinsically complex things. Slightly, you know, you require soft focus in order to see them. Um, you don't get precision when it comes to ideas. And that was what the original revelation of Christianity was. It was the imposition of this idea, this multifaceted complex reality on the mind of the church. And that as the church has digested and mulled over what has been impressed upon it, which takes time, doctrine has developed as we have done the unpacking. Um, now, back in Rome, revelation is being spoken of in much, much clearer terms. Much clearer terms. Uh, chapter one is scripture, chapter two is tradition, chapter three is theology. There's a great continuity in which 
Scripture represents the first chapter of doctrine, where Newman, Newman has a slightly more blurred focus as he looks towards what revelation is. The intrinsically mysterious character of it is something that he will, he will safeguard. So already you can see there's going to be a bit of tension between JHN and headquarters, and indeed there was. Um, he complains at various stages that he, he has lived much of his life under a cloud. And he says when he was given his cardinal's hat by the diplomat Leo XIII that the cloud had finally lifted. But he had an extraordinary genius for performing rain dances, um, doctrinally speaking, and the cloud kept coming back. And really it's only lifted finally since Vatican II. Uh, because in that period, his notion of what revelation was and his desire not to get over precise with, with, with what revelation is about. Now, Rome responded to its changed context in 1907 by defining and condemning a heresy that it called modernism. Um, and it could do this now, and the, the contrast you need to bear in mind here is the contrast with the, the syllabus of errors. Because the syllabus of errors was just a reactionary pope making a solo run. By the time Pius X takes over from Leo XIII, he has a much more coherent sense of Catholicism that he can in fact impose. Um, the, the encyclical is Pascendi, then there's another uh, uh, syllabus of further errors, which is Lamentabili, mostly taken from a New Testament exegete. Bad news for the New Testament folk. It, the New Testament was, was pretty much the battle zone here. And then in 1910, there was imposed something known as the Modernist Oath, which remained in place for Catholic clergy and other office holders until the late 1960s. So this is an extraordinarily wide-ranging impact, this, this definition of modernism as a heresy. The gentleman who drafted Pascendi was a French oblate um, whose, I had the pleasure of looking through his notes a couple of years ago in Rome, he, he was completely sold on the idea that scholasticism was the answer to our period. It really was the answer. And there is a real sense of, of heartbreak as you read his notes, as he's looking at what is happening around the Catholics who don't seem to be obedient to this vision. And he produces an extraordinarily complicated map of what makes a modernist. Because remember, he's looking from within a particular system. And that system gives extraordinary coherence to what he sees on the outside. So the modernist is a... Uh, is, is, is philosophically an agnostic. They're very deeply embedded in Kantianism. I beg your pardon. <clears throat> I've lost my input. Hmm. Did I do something or did... Ah, uh, you're going to come and lay hands on it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's it, yes, that's it, perfectly. This is what happens when you mess with modernism, you see. Just <laughs> Computer says no. <laughs> Canonization. Mm. Now I have to be really good, don't I? I can't, I can't foul it up again. Um, so these were, these were measures that were undertaken. And the, the, the funny thing is, I suppose, 
a lot of ink has been spilled on analyzing how Rome saw its enemies, how it saw the deviant insiders. But really the key thing is the people that it decided were deviant insiders, their, their central sin was that they simply didn't buy into the identification of Catholicism with neo-scholasticism. So you have people like the Frenchman um, and, and biblical exegete Alfred Loisy. Uh, you have people like the French philosopher Maurice Blondel. Um, you have another magnificent French philosopher who was a layman. Very unusual to have a lay theologian at the time, Edouard Leroy, who was the popularizer of Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, Leroy was marvelous because every time he was condemned, he said, oh dear, I'm terribly sorry, and kept going. Um, <laughs> because as a layman, they couldn't control him. It, but it was very good. I mean, he showed due deference to his ecclesiastical superiors. He was a professor of maths, um, so presumably he could always go back to private practice. Um, but this confirmed a view of Catholicism that, in a sense, anyone who was familiar with religion in the 20th century will know this kind of anti-engagement, anti-dialogue, very reactionary uh, unitary vision of Catholicism. And for the last couple of years, we've been looking at the 50th anniversary of Vatican II, where the Catholic Church, having been you know, plowing through the waves in the fashion of a large tanker, has tried to turn itself around quite suddenly. Um, and, and it's that that's turning around. And one of the key phrases here is integral Catholicism or integralism, because what was forged at the modernist crisis was a, a, a very coherent, an overly coherent vision of Catholicism as a deeply anti-modernist, very centralized body. And the fact that it's happening in this period is curious for those of us with an interest in so-called fundamentalist religiosity, because it's precisely the same period that things are happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, in terms of a nervousness about a kind of a liberalism. Here, however, this is something that is a, a very top-down, the institution acting uh, in its own defense as it sees it on the basis. So, so integral Catholicism, it has been, it, it, it's one of the, the curiosities. It t lasts until about 1963, officially, uh, and Pope John XXIII gives it an almighty whack in his opening speech at the Vatican Council when he says that the substance of the faith is one thing, the way in which it is expressed is another. And that was simply something that integral Catholicism did not allow for that distinction. That there was simply, instead of a, a complex whole, there was an undifferentiated totality. And these are very different kinds of things when it comes to talking about how, how Christianity transfers itself through the ages. Now, what got me into this was this question of uh, development, I was de development or evolution. Um, I, I, know, I know Joshua has a thing for the East. Um, so I've got John Henry Newman in iconic form. Um, he, 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 didn't, he didn't really look like that. I mean, this, is, <laughs> um, uh, this is John Henry Newman, uh, author of the, 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 the Development of Christian Doctrine in 1845. To his right is a, is a liberal Protestant called Auguste Sabatier, um, on whom I did my writing as, as a doctoral student. Um, as I said, I, I ended up writing about him almost by mistake because I kept getting irritated by finding data about him that was incorrect in most of the major dictionaries. And eventually I just had that little hissy fit where I said, right, I'll do it myself. Um, so I did. Um, th there's a difference obviously of age between them. Sabatier died in 1901. Newman had died just at the end of the 19th century, but they sort of overlap to some extent. And what's interesting about Sabatier is that he was clearly a Protestant. Like all good Protestants, he wrote about Paul. Um, you couldn't actually be a 19th century Protestant and not write about Paul. But he had written about Paul as a quite a conservative young man influenced by the uh, revival of the 1840s. And in writing about Paul, he felt that he wanted to make some allowance for some things that were coming out of the German critics. But he was particularly bothered that Bauer, in particular, had decided that Paul is this person here, had a very fixed idea of who Paul was, and therefore literature that didn't conform to this view of Paul couldn't have been written by Paul. 
and Sebastien felt that actually that, that people do change. You know, there is, a, there is a capacity for change. And he talked about the evolution of Pauline thinking. He didn't quite go with the whole idea that everything attributed to Paul was Paul, but he certainly was slightly more flexible than Bauer in terms of understanding that, that people change over time. And eventually that insight from his Pauline studies became the heart of what he was doing in first Strasbourg and then, and then Paris. He had the good fortune or or not, to start off, I think, his chair in Strasbourg just in time for the Franco-Prussian War. Um, he, he volunteered to serve with the artillery, and they, uh, they couldn't see that a doctorate in divinity was the ideal quality they were looking for, so they sent him off to run an ambulance service instead. Um, but he applied this more widely to doctrine, the idea that doctrine evolves. And in terms of emphasizing the word evolve, he was choosing it in conspicuous disagreement with Newman. Because he thought when Newman talks about development, Newman is over-egging the pudding in favor of continuity. Whereas the metaphor of evolution, as he sees it as a historian, is that ideas, just like various life forms, they, they come and they go. Some things develop a capacity to last, some things don't. And we can study things that sort of come into the the light of day at certain points and then sort of lose their hold on the imagination and, and aren't there anymore. So he felt that, you know, without going completely overboard on discontinuity, he wanted there to be more acknowledgement of it. So he, he insisted on evolution as being the answer. And one of his, he wrote a book in 1897 called Outlines of a Philosophy of Religion based on psychology and history, um, which with a title like that, became very curiously a bestseller and was quoted in debates in the French Parliament and so forth, um, which became quite influential in the modernist controversy and in a sense kicked it off because some of the modernists felt that they could... Commenting on Newman, he was, you know... Well, let's leave Newman to one side. But you see, if you started criticizing Sabatier, it sounded okay. It sounded like there you were, a good Catholic, having a go at the bad Protestant. But in terms of the criticism you were giving of the bad Protestant, you might find that you're actually agreeing a great deal with what he's saying. And in a way, this is key to some of the, the modernists who were trying to disentangle themselves from the, the modernist the modernist controversy. It didn't fool everybody. Jules Le Breton said of the modernists that they sweated Sabatier from every pore, which is not a very nice way of describing them, you know. Um, the gentleman on the left is George Tyrrell, who is, uh, was a, an Irish Protestant who moved from Irish Low Church Protestant to Irish High Church Protestant to Jesuit Roman Catholic and his very successful career ended with his excommunication in 1909. Splendid man. Um, um, the gentleman on the right is Alfred Loisy, the, the, the great uh, uh, French exegete. And they were both figures who, who fell foul of, of them. They're, they're probably the most famous people who fell foul of the modernist controversy. Loisy was condemned with the, the major excommunication. He was declared vitandus, therefore, None of the faithful can be in contact with them. We've um, a lovely letter written by a French bishop uh, to Loisy on the day of his being declared vitandus, saying, good heavens, I see I cannot be in contact with you anymore. Isn't that strange? <laughs> French bishops are marvelous. They have a strange idea of canon law. Um, Tyrrell was slightly more marvelous. He, he, had, he, had, he had a wonderfully witty phrase. Um, he, he, he once pondered whether the the Petrine statement, to S. Petrus, could be better translated as, you are a brick. Um, <laughs> uh, he's, 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 he has a very whimsical sense. There's a, he's, he's, there's a bit of the theological Edward Lear about, 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 about Cyril. Um, and he committed ecclesiastical suicide spectacularly when Pascendi came out by writing to the Times of London saying, this encyclical seeks to demonstrate to a modernist that, that they are no Catholic it merely succeeds in showing what they already knew, that they are no scholastic. And that seems to be the issue in, in a nutshell, as it were. But both of these 
had had very deep immersions in the thought of Newman. They had read Newman, they had digested Newman, they had read him very, very carefully. And yet, in many ways, they use Newman's name as a flag of convenience when they are taking a supportive line in relation to Sabatier and vice versa. So Sabatier and Newman were played around with a little bit because they were both people who wanted to have some acknowledgement of discontinuity, Sabatier rather, rather significantly more uh, than, than our friend John Henry Newman. So this is, I just want to say a few things about our friend Mr. Mr. Sabatier there at the end. Um, this is this kind of project that has been living in boxes in my study for a while, has a, has a working title of a white blackbird. Uh, Sabatier was friendly with Gustave uh, Flaubert, and that was Flaubert's description of him. Uh, he, uh, as, as a white blackbird, a most, a most unlikely French Protestant to, to have had this enormous influence indirectly with, within a body as enormous as, as French Catholicism. <coughs> His background was in the Reformed Church of France, originally an exegete. Um, he was a journalist. He was one of the editors of uh, the Times of Paris um, and, and was at the helm there, was one of four editors during the, uh, the, the crisis um, over between the military, the church, and the state in the early years of the Third Republic, uh, uh, which was quite a significant and exciting time to be there. He also wrote a, a column of literary criticism for a Swiss journal. Um, the journalistic and the literary things were largely as a result of his need for money. He's very typical Third Republic France. He's somebody who has come from peasant stock who was suddenly catapulted up into French society and expected to live accordingly. He is very largely forgotten now. Um, an Englishman who wrote about him called Thomas Silkston said he went to Strasbourg in the 1950s and 60s several times where they showed people around and said, and this is where the great Sabatier worked. And he said, oh, and what was great about Sabatier? Oh, we don't know, but this is where he worked. You know, he's, even within his own tradition, he is known as the great Sabatier. I think his Lutheran colleague preached a sermon at his funeral describing him as the greatest French theologian since Calvin, which... Um, that quotation seems to have lingered, so people feel we ought to know that he's great, but quite what he did, we don't know. His work continues to be reprinted, um, but what's extraordinary is when you look at his role, because Loisy <laughs> and Tyrrell, from the side of modernism, read him and found that there was something that was Catholicable, if there's such a word, in what he was saying. Tyrrell said at one stage, look, there is something in this man. If he expressed himself a little bit better, we could use him on the Catholic side. Um, precisely that caused him to be seen as a little bit of a head-scratcher for Protestants as to why he was interested in the medieval period because we know a priori the medieval period is just Catholic darkness. But he seems to be interested in it. Um, so that was on the modernist side. But on the anti-modernist side, the people who wrote against modernism, Lemieux, who, defined the, who wrote the encyclical, read Sabatier very, very closely. I have read through pages and pages of his notes on Sabatier as he tries to detect that this is really the problem. So Pescendi, the great condemnation of Catholic modernism, which remained in many ways in force until the 1960s, was partly written by Lemieux, as, a, as an attack on the position adopted by a French Reformed theologian who really gave him nightmares. Um, so it's quite extraordinary that this quite forgotten figure in some ways had this impact that Catholicism took until the 1960s to, to, to overcome and, and, uh, and, 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 and unthink itself. And one thing I'll leave you with, in a sense, the, I, I've mentioned what... John the Twenty Third said at the opening of Vatican II that there is the there is the way in which the gospel is expressed. That's one thing, and we can fiddle around with that. But then there's the unchanging content, which we can't touch. Um, that distinction, sort of a form and content distinction, was given its uh, 
theoretical expression in, in the Vatican Council's declaration on, or, de, or, or sorry, yes, declaration on ecumenism, where it talked about a hierarchy of truths. That rather than saying that, you know, every jot and every tittle carry equal amounts of doctrinal weight, there is within a complex entity like a religious tradition a hierarchy. Some things are connected more intimately to the point of origin than others. And as you read through what, what, what the Bavier had to say, you realize, in a sense, this was, we've come full circle in the course of little less than a century. That, that, that kind of call for some kind of differentiation within a doctrinal whole was really what he was looking for. And it was precisely what the modernists at the time were also looking for. So, in a way, it's a case study of doctrinal change and continuity and asking the question of, well, how do you orchestrate change? How do you work for change in a complex body like a church where there are not just ideas at work, but institutions and structures that also need to be turned around and that take time to form? Um, and it is really quite frightening to think of the, the anti-modernist oath as being in vogue until, until the 1960s. And what's even more bizarre is when Pope John XXIII gave that speech and made the distinction that he made and really cut an end to integralism when his official scribes <laughs> produced the official report of what he'd said, um, they, they, they had, <laughs> the spin doctors went into overdrive. Um, and they produced a, a complete mishmash of what he'd said, running contrary to what he'd said, and actually quoting the beloved anti-modernist oath uh, as part of his sermon. And it, it's one of those marvelous things that, you know, the people that ultramontanists <laughs> fear most is probably the Pope. But, but it also shows, you know, the deep-rootedness and the reluctance to change in an institution where these, these ideas take root and take shape. Thankfully, John the Twenty-Third knew exactly what they were like, and as he said himself, I shall take care in future to quote myself in the sense of what I actually said. And he did. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Stephen. Do you want to buzz for a minute or two? I, I, I'm never sure whether groups want to buzz or whether they actually actually fear it, but it might be no harm just to... There's been a lot of sitting passively, so please buzz. Okay, back to the minefield. <coughs> Very good. We, we, um, we, were, we were buzzing about church history, which is great. <laughs> the, the vested interest was working here. Um, so any, 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 any thoughts you'd like to share with the rest of us on, on what, where, where did the buzz go? I'm, I'm, I'm buzzing on to it um, about two years ago, I think. Um, I mean, it's been going on for a long time, but I think it's been going Yes, um, the, the, the process is well advanced for his, his canonization. Um, he, he, uh, I think when the, when the papal visit took place here in, was that 2012, when, when, when Benedict came over, um, I think we were, we were on the way to um, the next step. He's, he's gone as far as beatification at this stage. So, so canonization just awaits. I think he has to perform, or maybe he's performed enough miracles now, I can't remember. Marvelous man, really. Um, uh, we were involved slightly, I was working in, in a research centre in Dublin, which was it's the International Centre for Newman Studies at University College Dublin, and we were trying to get a connection going between the Birmingham Oratory, where Newman had spent most of his working life as a Catholic, um, 
and they were in a slight state of crisis because they were about to exhume the remains of John Henry Newman because as a venerated person, well, you have to have something to venerate, preferably the remains. Um, so they, I think one of, our, one of our number had gone over and seen this magnificently elaborate casket they had in which the remains of John Henry Newman would be available for veneration. Um, and then they dug him up and there was nothing there. Um, because uh, cunning, cunning man Newman, um, he, he had arranged for himself to, he's, he's buried in the, or he was buried at the, at the Licky Hills uh, near, near, near Birmingham. Um, they had added humus rich material, quote unquote, into the grave because uh, I, th I think Newman was trying to ensure that he would escape. Uh, so I think at the end they, they found, I think, a piece of hair and a brass clasp which may or may not have come from the coffin. Um, so his, his, his remains are now in a much smaller casket. <laughs> they would have fitted in a matchbox, actually. But anyway, so yes, it, it continues on. The, one of the philosophers who was involved at this stage was very important, was Baron Friedrich von Hugel. And von Hugel said of Newman that he felt that after his death, Newman might make it as far as beatification. But he said, you know, when you went to visit Newman, he said, he, he lacks the quality of joy. You know, you, you visit, Newman loved fighting. He really loved fighting. I mean, he would put his hands up and say, oh, I'm a very peaceful man and I want to be left alone. But <laughs> they all say that. Um, he, he, uh, he, he loved getting stuck into people. Uh, he really did. Um, and, and von Hugel said, when you come away after visiting Newman, you, you come away caught up in, you know, paranoid, persecution, <coughs> depression, you, you, you know, really, frankly, you know, it's, it's, I was going to say it's like visiting a bishop, I better not say that. Um, is it just, no, 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 he, 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 he doesn't, you don't come away inspired and full of joy. You know, you actually come away sucked into planet Newman, which seems a bit strange. So he's, maybe he's got as far as he's going, but he, I, think, I think he has the right number of miracles now. He, he was, John Paul II really, really wanted him canonized because John Paul II went around canonizing everything he could find to canonize. But there was very little happening in the, if you like, the NATO world. The Western industrial world wasn't producing saints. So Newman, was really important to him. And it took Newman a really long time to start working miracles, despite endless prompting. Um, so it has, it has taken a very, very long time to get as far as we've got. And whether, whether Francis, in his current role, thinks that that sort of thing is a priority for him, I would doubt very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was it about the do you think, Yeah, there was, there, yeah, there were quite a number of candidates. I mean, there was a, there, there's a, it's a bit of a philosophical battlefield in, in 19th century Catholicism. Um, I mean, the, the major contenders were there was a group of people who we, we call traditionalists. This is, I don't know, it's about. I don't know how many different senses of the word traditionalists there are, but there was a kind of traditionalism uh, associated with, um, um, uh, now what was his name? Um, well, there were different, different shades of traditionalism, but they all tended to assume that um, the ideal answer to our current problems was the restoration of the alliance of throne and altar. That, that really, that... that that French experiment with democracy was a disaster, and it had simply led to, to, to appallingness for the church. So France became very much the test case. Um, the Prussian love-hate relationship with the Jesuits was also a test case, as it's whether could a democratic state live with Catholic teaching orders? And, and you know, periodically the Jesuits get thrown out of a country and you end up thinking, it mm, doesn't look like this is going to work, does it? Um, so traditionalism was one answer. Fideism was another philosophical answer. I, I think Aquinas won out in the end because of his associations with the great synthesis of 
of faith and reason. That, that there was that great nostalgia for we, we, the modern period, in a sense, begins with the rupture of faith and reason and nominalism driving them apart. And I think that was what Leo was hankering after, that kind of unitary vision, that, that faith and reason would mutually inform each other. It's one of the great ironies, though, that, I mean, Thomas Aquinas was the, the, the modernist of his day and spent a lot of his time fighting off church councils that were trying to drag him here, there, and yonder for heresy because he had discovered that he quite liked Aristotle and he found him rather helpful. Um, and yet, within a period of centuries, he's become the, the reactionary's pinup. And the, the, the sad thing in that, in a sense, I suppose, is that for generations of when mandatory scholasticism was in vogue, it tended to be quite low-grade Thomism. Because this, in order to impose Thomism, you end up producing manuals of theology um, that, that you know, gave you the Thomistic flavor on God, on Trinity, on Christology, on everything. You simply read the manual, learned it off, and that was the answer. And you had jumped through the hoop uh, towards holy orders. Um, it's not really an engaged theology. Um, Alfred Loisy said he had a nervous breakdown reading, reading Thomas Aquinas because Thomas Aquinas mediated through the people who had written the, the manuals, was busy answering questions that he didn't ask, had no intention of asking, didn't know anybody who asked them, uh, and couldn't understand why he was being required to learn all these dubious answers. Um, so it has really taken until our day, really, for that kind of compulsory Thomism to lose its hold and for people to begin to think, you know, Aquinas wasn't bad. You know, he was quite good, so long as you don't have him as this kind of ultimate guru. <laughs> I once compared Alistair McGrath's introduction to Christian theology to a scholastic manual. He, he, wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't very happy. <laughs> Joshua. I think, I think there's quite a, a few things that would strike me on, on looking at it. I think one of the most obvious in terms of how, how the Catholic Church at the time um, dealt with it is that it had a, a very negative view of how dissent functions in, in, in a large tradition. Um, you know, one, Once you've decided that Dissent equals heresy equals to be silenced. Um, you automatically lose something that you may actually need as a resource for how you think yourself out of it. Um, I mean, I mean it, it is an extraordinary era, and it's still with us in a sense. I mean, it's, it's not as though that this is an era that's over. There is still the, the congregation for the doctrine of the faith. They're still occasionally picking on theologians whose whose errors, uh, it's very hard to work out. Um, 
we had a lecture recently in, in, in Maynooth in Ireland by Elizabeth Johnston, whose, whose book, The Search for the Living God, has been condemned by the American bishops. Um, I, I, I've read it um, a couple of times. I use it with students, many of whom are, are Catholic in Trinity, and it's a marvelous book. It's, it, it's, it's stunningly inoffensive, helpful, engaged. Now, perhaps Professor Johnston has upset the bishops about other things she said and done, but this way of, of wielding ecclesiastical authority, there are times when the church must say things and, and it must draw lines. Um, learning how not to do so prematurely is something I hope people, can, the churches can gather from this. This was a place where lines were, were drawn in advance, never mind prematurely. Um, so I think that's one of the things, is, is what do you do with dissent? Uh, and, and how can you creatively manage it? Secondly, I think there's a question about the nature of theology and its connection to church life. Um, a, a number of people have, have commented on the way in which uh, theology very often not, not only is a marginalized discipline within church and university, but it very often colludes with its own marginalization. Um, and that's very unhealthy. I mean, when I put up the, the, the pictures of Tyrrell and Loisy, they were both, I mean, Loisy later became quite, quite strange in his theological views, but at the time that he was trying to produce a defense of Catholic Christianity, he was one of those people who, who was trying to find connections with contemporary culture. That there was no point, as he saw it, in the Catholic Church in France persisting in answering a particular or responding in a certain way to the Third Republic because it just seemed negative, carping, endlessly critical. There needed to be real engagement. But that was simply forbidden by the, the dominant theological orthodoxy of the time. George Tyrrell, similarly, was used by the Jesuits during his, the good days of his career. He was one of their secret weapons in Farm Street. Um, Farm Street is a, is, is a curious Jesuit foundation. Um, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but I just, I remember one person just barking at me, Farm Street, Jesuits, fur coats, no knickers. And I thought, oh, I get you, thank you, very interesting. Um, quite an interesting exposure to, to, to the, the pastoral life of Kensington. Um, but Tyrrell had picked up in particular some of the disastrous cases of, of, of pastoral neglect in the 19th century, particularly people who were affected by the collapse of the Oscar Wilde circle. He was involved by the Jays in trying to reach out to people who were really feeling very marginalized and, and, and threatened. So they were quite experimentally interesting theological people. And what's curious in both Tyrrell and Loisy was the depth of their experiential theology. There is a depth in French spirituality that is in Loisy and is in his early Catholic writings that is deeply experiential, deeply mystical. It's, it's pointing back to the, the, the great period of the rout of the mystics in, in the 17th century. Similarly, Schleiermacher's thoughts on experience were echoed in Sabatier. And I think that was what made him, in a sense, able to speak both to the more conservative and to the, the less conservative of the French church of his day. And, and Tyrrell spent all his life working up a commentary on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, which he then put up in flames because they, weren't, they just weren't finished, they weren't ready. So that, that connection, a theology that actually answers to the devotional life of the church. I mean, we... We're, we're, we're all busy defining ourselves now. The university has entered into a, an unholy alliance with, 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 with big business, really. I think to, make a, to have a good degree means to have lots of students taking it as opposed to anything else. Um, it, it, that kind of marketing thing needs to be relativized by the purpose of what that theology is. I think that's one of the important questions that comes out of this period. What, what is theology? What does it do? The neo-scholastic said, well, it's, it's simply a series of truth claims that you trot out. Um, if it's something other than that, if it's trying to provide some kind of critical reflection 
on what it is we think we believe and how we think we believe it and how we form connections with those who, who don't perhaps hold these views but might. That's a different kind of theology. That's a good one, yeah. I mean, the, 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 I suppose it's interesting because that's one of the political rivalries, in a sense, the, 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 Jesuit, the Jesuit Thomist rivalry. Um, the, I suppose the theological rivalry was always much more between the Thomists on one hand and the Augustinians and Franciscans on the other. What, what, I, 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 I think there's two answers to that. Um, the first is that in terms of what was being required of the orders, or what was being required of the Catholic Church by the end of the 19th century, was a return to Thomas full stop. Therefore, the Dominicans cheered loudly because their man had won. On the other hand, the various orders always had their chosen interpreters of Thomas. And in the case of the Jesuits, it was the Spanish uh, post-Tridentine uh, Suarez who was the chosen interpreter, who managed to give us Thomas sounding like a Jesuit. Uh, and th this is the way, of course, you domesticate these issues. In fact, the first time George Tyrrell got into trouble in Rome was because he was teaching Thomas, according to the encyclical of 1879, he was teaching Thomas according to Thomas. Um, so, I mean, as the Protestants were going after the historical Jesus, he was going after the historical Thomas, which was not, not was, was just as popular as the historical Jesus, arguably, possibly less so. Um, so there was that internal pluralism within Catholicism that this attempt to inform uniformity masked. Um, the other thing I'd say about the, the interesting thing about the Jesuits is that there is a very strong level of regional, regionality with the Jesuits. So it depends where you, you get them. Um, there is, for sheer entertainment and depression value, there is a marvelous book by David Shulton over an American Jesuit. He's the, one of the editors of Theological Studies. Uh, it's, I think it's simply called uh, A View from Rome. Uh, Shulton over found that the modernist era, the, 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 the key general of the Jesuits, marvelous to think that your head is a general. Uh, the, the general at the time, Martin, was a Spanish man. Uh, who kept a journal. He wasn't meant to, uh, but he kept it so as that his language skills would be kept up in French and Spanish rather than the Italian and Latin that he was using as general, mostly. Um, so he, get, and he, he gave orders for it to be smuggled out of Rome in the event of his death. Uh, and it's a most marvelous view inside a religious order uh, and its inherent complexities, but also the fact that this is, this is definitely the Roman center point of the operation, where we have to tread carefully because we've been closed down before. But at the time, they were very strong. I mean, the, the, you would say that in terms of the modernist controversy, in terms of the politics, the, the Dominicans may have had their man at the helm doctrinally, but the three people who ran Rome were Pius X, Martin, the Jesuit general, and Cardinal Mary del Val, the Cardinal Secretary of State. Um, uh, and each more cracked than the other, um, each more paranoid than, than the other. It's, it's really quite marvellous. Um, Martin was very worried about English Jesuits, very, very worried about them. He, he, he believed that they were intrinsically effeminate. Uh, and for evidence of this, he pointed at the way they drank sherry. Yeah, I mean, I have no... I have no idea what they did, whether they just put on pink dresses in order to drink sherry or what, what it was about drinking sherry, but English Jesuits worried him uh, with, the, with, the, with the way in which they drank their sherry. Um, 
And therefore, in a sense, the English Jesuits handled George Tyrrell extremely well. They had a, a talented, somewhat maverick figure, and they worked very well with them. Uh, eventually, they had, a, they had a mission house up in Richmond in Yorkshire, which is where they put all their mad people. And Tyrrell's letters from there are extremely enjoyable because he's actually quite happy to be stationed with the lunatics um, for, for a while at any rate. Um, but, but Rome knew better. They, they really did. And it's, it really is a most remarkable document of, of the paranoia that was going on. But, you see, the English province was very English in its understanding of itself. The French province had to contend with the fact that some of the crazier independent religious orders that had grown up in the early 19th century, mostly founded on a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Christ, which you think would be, well, if it's devotion to the saving humanity of Jesus, it should be a little bit more pro certain things, but was deeply anti-Semitic and pro-monarchic. And some of them even had extraordinary chivalric armor. Um, so eventually I think the church decided, right, you're all mad, uh, stop doing that, you're all becoming Jesuits. So the French Jesuits managed to combine people who <laughs> went in for role-playing with military equipment and burning statues of Jews, and people who went to the library and studied Ignatius. Um, so it was a very mixed bag that had to be controlled by the church at the time. So, and, and Prussia was just itching to get back where it had been. You know? So very, very different sort of situations. Well, thank you. Great. Well, thank you again to Andrew very much indeed.